What is up, everybody? Welcome into Tom Curran's Patriots Talk podcast. As always, it's featuring Phil Perry, and we're also bringing in a good friend, Pete Kendall. Of course, Pete, being local, he's staying up with the Patriots. And the, and the main reason I wanted to have him on is his expert analysis that he can give us. And I want to dive into what the Patriots are trying to establish right now. You saw that second offensive play in the final preseason game against the Raiders. It was an outside zone run to the left. They ended up losing three with Ramonde Stevenson. That play in particular and the outside zone scheme in general, we've all talked about it incessantly in this training camp. What are your thoughts on that play and how it went and what it might augur? So the, the Raiders had a, uh, had a great defense um, for the zone scheme. And without getting too far down in the weeds, basically every, off, every, every covered offensive lineman had a tough reach. And the uncovered offensive lineman had a hard time being able to offer help to the covered lineman before going to uh, the linebacker level. Mm-hmm. I, I think you see, you, you see on that um, maybe Trent stays on the double team uh, a little bit too long and the linebackers over the top, but it's an impossible reach for Cole if Trent doesn't give him body presence. Coming at the and left guard the spot. Thing, yeah, and it's the same thing outside for the, for the two tight ends. If the wing goes right now to go, to go get the safety who's playing uh, contain outside, the on, the on the ball tight end has almost no chance of reaching the defensive end because he's out leveraged him by alignment. And so usually you get in a situation like that. I can't run this play to the front side. We, we've drawn it up. We've talked about it. This is a bad look. We're going to go back to the other side. Um, but the reality is, is that inside zone or outside zone back to the other side, it's essentially the same situation. The Raiders by just their defensive play alignment had the, the Patriots um, outflanked. And so the, the, the simplest solution there is because of that, that front that they're playing, the Raiders are, pr- are playing man or more likely some form of cover three. Those corners do not want to get beat. They're going to run off. You should be able to throw hitches at that all day long. And you know, I'm, no, I, I'm no offensive guru, um, but I'm sure that people on the Patriots staff are, are clearly aware of what their other solutions are. You know, when we were coaching in high school, we called them a, a run solution throw. Um, can't run it right, can't run it left. They're giving us the quick, easy throw out there. Max throws it outside. They go, you know, it, it was, I believe, second and three at the time, plus or minus mm-hmm. second and four. Take the easy throw. It's third and one or it's first down. You're ahead of the chase. And, you know, I, I appreciate why, why people are a little bit nervous because the Pats are kind of running a play that sort of once you break the huddle and put your hand in the dirt, you're like, this isn't a good run. But there are situations in a game where you have to run the ball into a look that isn't ideal. You know, whether it's you get the play call late and you don't have time at the line of scrimmage to adjust. And so you just try to make the best of it or the game situation dictates we're running it here. Maybe we're, you know, maybe we're up five points with three and a half minutes to play and, and we can't take the risk of, of, you know, a bad throw or a drop or an incomplete mm-hmm. or something like that. And, and so we're going to go, we're going to go take our chances running the ball. Um, even though we don't, you know, ideally, if we were on the grease board, we, we wouldn't do it that way. Phil, you have reported and, and the, your understanding is they're, they're just running a lot of these plays right now and not audibling out, it, it, away from them. This kind of tracks, doesn't it? Oh, man, this is verbatim <laughs> what I've heard from people with the team all summer, really, Pete, which is so much of what they're doing preseason games practices too is just going with these call and run plays we're going to run this play whatever it was that was called in the huddle almost no matter what regardless of the look but it sounds like based on this one play and we talked about a few uh, last week with Matt Castle on the next Pats podcast in the passing game where he said the same thing this is the kind of play where you might get to the line of scrimmage and say well this is a horrible look for this play it's probably not going to go all that well but they run it anyway. Is that just sort of, you know, based on your experience, is that is that standard in preseason, though? Or would you expect, even in an exhibition like that, that it might be a good idea to change the play because the rep that you're going to get isn't maybe going to be the most valuable in that situation? I don't know about standard, Phil, but it's it's unsurprising, you know, with the Patriots, you know, this quote-unquote element of surprise, perhaps, that they, they think they might have, given that they you can't kind of nail down who the play caller is. 
And so, and they haven't necessarily, you know, been a outside zone featured team in the past. And so while most, most defensive staffs, most football coaches know, you know, the, the solution that I offered or that other, you know, what other solutions are to, to various looks, I still think there is some benefit um, for the Pats in not showing what solutions they're going to use um, to these unfavorable looks. And so it, it makes sense to me. Um, one, that they wouldn't show them, and two, that there might be some some frustration because, hey, look, the game's on tape. You're a competitor. You're a professional player. You don't want to look bad in any circumstance. And and when you, you know, sometimes you get up there and, you know, this is it's not going to be good. <laughs> um, you just have to hope that it's, that it's understood by the evaluators, you know, by your position coach, by your coordinator, by your head coach, by the personnel department, whatever, because that's the concern as a player is, if I'm not, if I don't have a job here, and somebody else puts on the tape and and, and sees me getting blown on, into the backfield because I didn't have a chance to succeed from Jump Street, you know, is that is that ideal? So I I, I understand both sides of this clearly. Um, why the Pats see benefit in kind of holding back some of their stuff in the preseason, and why maybe some guys might be a little bit frustrated that hey, I'm out here playing, let's have some success. If we're going to be out here and I get taped anyways, like let's go score a touchdown before we go sit on the sideline. So who can make that call? When we were talking the other day, you said Trent Brown could make that call. You must have made some lying calls in that communication up front. How vital is that communication? Who can make those calls to to direct it? You almost have to be that hand in a glove thing, right? Yeah, it, it, certainly you would see this as you spent time in the film room. You know, they're, they're, they're playing a rookie there at left guard, so maybe maybe too much to ask him to, to make that call. But he's he's the one with the poorest angle. Right. So he's the one that's most threatened. So it might it might seem naturally be like, I got no chance to reach this guy. Hey, can we do something else here? And and then maybe it's Trent who decides to make the down block call or one of the tight ends notices. Hey, we went into the we went into the film room this week. We saw that if they put the end outside and in the, in the uh, safety outside of the wing that we want to block down. Now we're going to pull the guard. He's going to go kick the safety. Everybody else blocks down a gap. Now the only guy who can make the tackle is the safety coming from the middle of the field. It, it goes from a dead play to something that you think has a chance to score. And it's just just by changing up the blocking assignment a little bit. The Patriots have spent a lot of time then, as we've acknowledged, hiding things going into the season. There's benefit in unveiling them, but how much risk might there be in unveiling them for the first time in the heat and uncertainty of a road game to open the season with rookie left guard? Well, I, I guess there's I guess there's risk if they haven't done it at all. But my my strong suspicion is that they they've repped it pretty well um, in in camp uh, and in the practices leading up to the game. And I also think that some of the solutions we talked about, Tom, are, are pretty basic and, and and things that guys are are pretty familiar with. So I, I still think uh, it's much more to the Patriots' advantage to have a couple of things in their back pocket that they haven't shown. Uh, much like every other team. Is going to have some things in their back pocket that they haven't shown for week one. How hard will it be for Matt Patricia to hold down both the offensive coordinator, play caller, and offensive line jobs? Pete, I've never, I've never seen it done. Um, I have seen instances where you have an offensive line coach who serves as the offensive coordinator, uh, but the head coach is the one actually making the play calls. And I'm thinking specifically of the Saints under Sean Payton and and my old coach Doug Marone, where Doug would coach the, uh, the fat guys and he would serve as the coordinator during the week and set the table. But Sean was the play caller on Sunday, which allowed Doug then to spend his time um, making adjustments, uh, in-game adjustments. So um, I know that Matt has an assistant. I believe his name is, is Billy Yates. I don't know Billy, nor do I know his background. Um, but if they have a lot of faith in Billy's ability to make in-game, in-game adjustments and to work with experienced guys like, like David Andrews, uh, that it could work that Matt is going to be, you know, both the titular uh, offensive line coach and the play caller because he can assign some game day responsibilities in other places. What's been interesting about the operation when we've seen it, Pete, during these preseason games is that uh, Billy Yates hasn't even been on the sidelines at times, which tells me, I assume, he's up at the press box level somewhere trying to see things from from up high and get a good look at things that way. But we also haven't seen Patricia always going to work and talk with and give suggestions to Mac Jones in between series. So what do you think is the best way to to iron all of this out? Would it just be to 
have Billy Yates sort of coach in between series like you're talking about and have Patricia work with with Mac Jones? Because it's really been more Joe Judge who's been alongside Mac in between series. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what the what the right solution is. The conventional, you know, the, the conventional situation is that the, the the offensive line coach is down on the on the sideline on game day. The assistant offensive line coach is up in the booth trying to help identify fronts and personnel and uh, potentially uh, coverages. Um, you know, they're, they're they're going about it a little bit different now. And, and based on on what you say, to my own observations is I, I don't think how they've operated so far is necessarily going to be how they'll operate. On Sunday, there may be there you know there may be something a little bit different um, in their uh, real game operation as well. As a Patriots fan, Patriots observer, local guy, what's the thing that you're most optimistic about going into this year? What's the thing that you would be most pessimistic about, Pete Kendall? So I like the quarterback. I think the thing that I like most about Mac is his ability to process. You know, he showed that I think last year as a as a rookie. Um, and I think if you, if you have a guy who can, you know, take coaching and make adjustments and make corrections, uh, I think you have a chance on, you know, basically on every play and, and in every, every game. I think they've upgraded a little bit at, uh, at receiver. And I think, you know, a lot of these guys now have, have one more year together. Obviously, you know, the team's a little bit different than it was last year. Um, but, and they have a rookie playing up front, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, David's going to be a great guy for him to lean on. I think that the offense has been, I think, maybe over maligned, but we'll see. That's why they play the games. I, I just think that it's it's too early. I know you have a podcast to do today, but I do think it's too early to um, <laughs> to assign a grade to the Patriots offense in week zero. Pessimistic then? Um, I, I think some of the troubles that they, they seem uh, to have in, in keeping Mac upright. In the, in the passing game, and it's a it's a limited sample, but I it, it's I guess more the reporting I hear from you guys in practice um, than what we saw in the preseason because they didn't you know they didn't play a thousand snaps in the in the preseason. Um, but that would be that would be a concern as if you know they've they've got a fairly sizable investment in some of those players up front. Um, if we can't if you can't lean on those guys to to give the quarterback uh, some time to stand in there and deliver it, then that you know that's probably a concern. Phil, it's my understanding you have your very own podcast called the Next Pats Podcast, and you've lined up uh, Tom House for the same time here, apparently. Uh, we have. We have. Well, Tom's Tom's working on West Coast time. You know, he's got that easygoing uh, San Diego lifestyle going out there, and I think this is probably the, the most strenuous thing he'll do all day, so I think he wants to get it out of the way early. Fair. And so we're going to do that now before he goes and works with his, Yo, uh, one with his more, you got anything for Pete? Because I know you get ridiculous on the X's and O's. And I think that the, he is an absolute fountain. He's an Oracle for us that we will be talking to frequently. Yeah. It's so fascinating to, to get his take on how they can handle certain plays, run game, pass game, having answers to the test, which is how Tom Brady once put it. I think, I think Mac Jones will have some of those answers. I think Pete's um, thought on Mac Jones and why he likes him. Is a, is a reason for all Patriots fans to be optimistic about this team. I just, I look at the, the Dolphins in particular, Pete, just to spin it forward a little bit to week one, they're going to blitz a lot. How difficult do you think Cole Strange's job will be? Having been a guy who played mm -hmm. a lot as a rookie, because obviously a lot's on his plate right now. Yeah, it, it could be hard. It could be baptism by fire. Um, you know, a lot of that stuff, unfortunately, if they, if they get, especially if they get a jump on your cadence, um, where they're going to time it that you can't, that David may not be able to make a call over to him or, or Trent may not be able to make a call over to him. And, uh, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's not an ideal setup for, uh, for a rookie player, but I, I know they like him and it's going to happen eventually. So I, I think he'll do okay. And, and certainly he'll learn something either way. Phil screw. Thanks guys, Pete. Great to talk to you. Hopefully we'll talk to you soon. Very talk good. To you soon. All right, we're going to talk about Phil now that he's left the room. See, it, it's great to know that that you, as being a uh, a consumer of media too, because you like the game, um, you've enjoyed Phil's insights, huh? Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's been very interesting to hear you guys, uh, you know, to hear the reports and, and to see you on uh, to see you on Quick Slants and with Trenny and all of that stuff. It, you've heard the ongoing conversation about the wide zone scheme. Um, I know you played for, for Mike Holmgren 
which is basically, you know, he's a Walsh disciple. Did you play much in the wide zone scheme? Yeah, that was sort of our base scheme uh, before even Mike showed up in, in Seattle. Um, learned it under Howard Mudd, one of the legendary offensive line coaches. Oh, yeah, so he would have gone to – Howard Mudd went Indianapolis. to Indy, right? So, and yeah, basically, they were running Manning. the same stuff. They were running wide yeah. zone with Edger and James. Yes. Okay. And so, so, you know, one of the things that, uh, that came up early in the press conferences, Tom, I don't know if it was you or Phil or somebody else who asked, and, and Bill was kind of – he seemed a little annoyed with the question. It, it had to do with the timing of the run game installation. Mm-hmm. And I, I kind of felt for Bill because like everybody install, everybody has the same run schemes. There are like very rarely any new plays in the NFL. It all comes down to what, what do you emphasize and what do you build, what do you build most of your offense off of? Right. And so, you know, you can look at the Patriots, you know, say last year, um, in years past, you might say they built their play action game off of sort of the, the man gap stuff that was a little more downhill yep. and so the quarterbacks drops were might have been a little straighter back and um and then you look at other teams like the how the rams do it well their play action game is built more off of you know stick it in the running back's belly make it look like outside zone okay and then either boot out around or pull up in the tackle box and so that's a little bit of a tweak a little bit different for, for mac but uh, he strikes me as being athletic enough to do both can um, i just say one quick thing just to, to paint the picture with the straight ahead, we all remember Tom Brady turning his shoulders towards the um, right sideline, hand in the belly, ball in the belly, pull it out, stand up tall, look. Now with the wide zone, there'll be more of you would bring it to the edge, to the tackle box on the left, keeping the ball there, and then turn your back a little bit and stand up tall if you were to the left. Is that correct, kind of? Yeah, or, tip, or more typically, especially going to the left, you, you, you boot out the other way. So you're trying to get that defensive end to suck down. You run back out the right side. Now the quarterback has a run pass option. You've got, you've got receivers coming from the left side across the field. You know, that it, it, it tends to favor a more athletic quarterback. So I can understand why it wasn't a staple of the Tom Brady offenses, particularly after, uh, after the calendar suggested he was north of 40 years old. Um, but Going back to my earlier point about Bill's yeah, uh, seeming, seeming annoyance, perhaps, with the question, every camp I was ever in, day one was, you know, let's just say inside zone. Day two was outside zone, so now you have inside zone and outside zone. Day three was we're going to put in uh, the angle-angle pull, so people call it power or counter, where you're blocking down on the front side and pulling one or two people from the back side, right? And then it's that, so that's day three. So now day four comes, you're responsible for that, and now we're going to have our pin and our, our pin and pull concepts, right? And those are like when the receiver comes down and the tackle pulls outside into the alley, right? It's just, it was sort of like clockwork. Now, which day each play was installed might, might have differed from scheme to scheme, um, but they all got installed and they're all the same. They're universal concepts that everybody has in their playbook. Now the question just becomes, which ones are you dialing up more often? Which ones are you building your, your scheme, your play action scheme around more? And, you know, the passing scheme is, is sort of the passing scheme, you know, whether they, whether they call the projection that protections, you know, two jet, three jet, or they call it ace or scat, um, whether they, whether they label the routes with numbers like the old passing tree numbers, 989, you know, mm-hmm. or they're calling it, you know, two jet dancer, or you hear the John Gruden, right? Uh, spider two, Y banana, <laughs> right? Spider two is your protection. Y banana is, is, you know, your concepts, uh, tell them what the wire is. So, Anyways, I, I don't worry as much about a change um, from Mac as, as far as the passing game. Now, maybe I'm completely naive, but I, I don't worry that much about it. I just think, you know, ball is ball, and it comes down to figuring out what your players do, what your players do best, and potentially and or what your opponent does worst. And I think Bill's got a pretty good track record in, in doing that. And so, you know, I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready to see it play out before I before I have any firm opinion on on some of the changes uh, that they've made. Immense amount of foreplay that we go through now, isn't it? I mean, from friggin' mini camp on with podcasts and articles and small stories and big stories and two to six and 10 to two and six to 10 on the radio. It's, it's gotta be bananas compared to what you came up in. Well, yeah, I mean, I was pre-internet days. I mean, I actually used to have to go, go buy a newspaper to see what people were saying about the game. So it's it's changed a lot, but 
in the long run, it's what's best for everybody involved in the NFL. The money obviously has gone, you know, gangbusters and um, it's allowing other people who aren't, you know, players or coaches to make a living. You know, some guys have their own podcast now with their name on it and everything, making money. I wanted to ask you this because you were just a an employee who did an outstanding job employee, but I guess that's fair too. You were part of a labor force that was very concerned about employees' rights. Um, you were a leader in the locker room in terms of making sure that, that players were unionized and, and involved, correct? Am I misspeaking here? Nope. No, I was involved. Up on their rights. So everything's intertwined. Performance, production, et cetera. I'm going to ask you this then. If you were Mac Jones' agent, what would your great concerns be entering the 2022 season for your client? Well, I, I think a couple of things. One, you know, the immediate, right? The, the physical, like, are they going to be able to keep him upright? Are they doing what they can to, to make sure he, he, finish, he plays 17 games and finishes healthy, right? But that... I think that's every agent's concern for every player, no matter where you, where you are. Um, and, and my second, I guess, larger concern would be, okay, we're on our second offensive coordinator or second offensive uh, concept here in year two. What's year three look like? Is, mm-hmm. is, this, is, this, the, is, is this something that he's got to grow into over time? And this is going to be the, uh, the philosophy and the approach uh, for the foreseeable future? Or, you know, as some people apparently have, have, have speculated is, is Matt doing this for a year or two and then somebody is going to be somebody else's vision and are they going to be on the same page and is that going to be, you know, what's best for Matt? I mean, the agent has to always be concerned with the client first and foremost, right? Which is, you know, not necessarily how, how Bill and, and his staff have to approach, you know, building the team, you know, longer term and in the bigger picture. I mean, is it fair? It is fair, <laughs> but it feels like sacrilege to say, well, geez, Bill, you got a guy who's never been a play caller before who seemingly is going to be the play caller, and you also have him doing double duty as an offensive line coach, and he hasn't done that since 04. And we're not just going from Joe Blow offensive coordinator. We're going to the, one of the best there's ever been who had a great relationship with, with Mac. I mean, we give so much deference to Bill because of his resume, and we ought to give a nod to the resume, but the present situation doesn't that favor for Mac Jones, I guess is what I'm driving at. And I think that it's okay to have concerns and acknowledge, yeah, you were great, but this looks a little left up. Well, I think, and I don't know Bill at all, but I think even he might acknowledge that this is an unconventional approach. I, I think it's hard to, I think it's hard to refute that, right? Because I can't, I can't name anybody who's ever, done anything like this or anything uh, approaching this. That said, I, I, I still played in a rather small window of time and I'm not, you know, intimately aware of, of what's gone on necessarily in other organizations, but I, I've never heard of, um, you know, somebody coming from the defensive side of the ball and, and working perhaps primarily in personnel, coming back to the sideline to be a head position coach, having never been a head position coach at that level. Um, and then also assuming play calling duties, having not called plays on that side of the ball at that level either. So I think unconventional is, is, is a, certainly a very fair way to characterize it. And uh, I think it's, you know, I also think it's fair to say that, you know, there are, there, there are going to be questions of, about this. And if it doesn't work out, you know, the, the, the first and most easy answer is, is to point to the structure, even if that's not necessarily the reason why it may not work out. All right, I think we've gone as far as we can. We need a goddamn game, don't we? We do need a game. Luckily, <laughs> luckily we have one on Sunday, and if you can't wait till then, we have a good one on Thursday night. Uh, hey, I'm actually going down to West Palm this week because they're going there early. Do you think that's a smart move by them? Patriots are going to uh, uh, practice Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and get acclimated. I do. I do think it's. I do think it's a smart move. I, I've heard somebody um, quoted as saying, "You know, getting out on that field pregame." Uh, if you haven't been acclimated to it, can be kind of something that takes your breath away. And if it's a mid 90s degree day and, and high humidity, that that was exactly my experience having opened there uh, in the past as well. So uh, go down, kind of just just get used to it. So it's not mm-hmm. such a shock to the system. Get used to going out and starting and 
and and hopefully starting fast and and so that you, the first thing you think about isn't oh my god it's hot it's like all right we get we're, right, it's hot we're going to go play whatever. All right, hey Pete Kendall, uh, really appreciate you. Appreciate you all the time, and definitely want to keep doing this as the season goes along because I think your insights are going to be incredible. Actually, after we have some hard evidence as to what the Patriots' 2022 plan is, which might be eye-opening for us pessimists. Could be indeed. That's where my money is, but we'll see. That's what makes a market. <laughs>